A number of years ago, there were some researchers that were researching about resilience and researching about hope. Now, often these researchers will do their research on experimental animals, and so they were doing research on rats, and they took two tubs of water, and as they took those two tubs of water, they put one group of rats in one tub of water, and they wanted to find out how long those rats could survive. And within one hour, every one of those rats died. They drowned. They took another group of rats and they put them in a tub next to that. And they waited like five or ten minutes and they put their hand in and pulled the rat out. Then they put it back in the water. Pulled the rat out, put it back in the water. Those rats swam for 24 hours. Not one of them drowned. And so the researchers began asking, why did this happen? And this is the conclusion they, they came. Not because the rats were given a rest, but because suddenly they had hope. The animals hoped that if they could just stay afloat for a little longer, somebody would reach into that pan, that tub, and pull them out. Now, if hope holds such power for unthinking rodents, what a greater effect should hope have on our lives, no matter what circumstance we're going through. The director of a medical clinic told the story of a terminal Ill, terminally ill young man. This young man came in to have his regular treatment. He wasn't expected to live very long, but he was not aware of that. As the young man left, he was the treatment. His head was in his hands and he was just crying, he was just sobbing. So the director of the medical treatment said, well, why are you sobbing so much? He said, well, the, when the doctor came in, the doctor said this, you don't know this, but you have about a year to live. And as the young man left, he stopped by the director's desk and he wept and he said, that man took away my hope. I guess he did, the director said, but you better find a new hope or else you won't live. Commenting on this experiment, uh, a psychologist by the name of Louis Smerdis wrote, is there a hope when hope is taking away? That's a question to raise. When all your hope is gone, is there still hope? Is there hope when the situation is hopeless? I don't know what situation you're facing today. Maybe it's with your health. Maybe it's with your children. Maybe it's with your marriage. Maybe it's with your finances. Is there hope for you when the situation appears hopeless? Now that question leads us to the Christian hope. For in the Bible, hope is no longer a passion for the possible. It becomes a passion for the promise. Now I don't want you to miss that. See, in the Bible, hope is not some passion for the impossible. Hope is a passion for the promise. It leads us to cling to and believe in the promises of God. Now, the Bible is filled with hopeful promises. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans, the 15th chapter, and we're looking there at the fourth verse. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before... That's, he's speaking about the Old Testament. Whatever things were written before, Romans 15, what verse everybody is it? Four. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the purpose of the stories of the Old Testament is to give us hope. That as we study them, and see the experiences that the Old Testament giants of faith went through. Sometimes they walked through valleys. Sometimes they sang on mountaintops. Sometimes they went through storms. Sometimes the days were fair. Sometimes their lives were engulfed in darkness. Other times the light of grace was shining upon them. But as we read those stories, our hearts, too, can be filled with hope. Now, notice carefully the experiences of the Old Testament believers were recorded for one reason, to give us hope. One of the most discouraging 
Yet hopeful stories in all of the Old Testament is the story of Jacob. Now Jacob's story is a story of hope amidst failure. It's a story of hope amidst defeat. It's a story of deceit, lies, anger, and broken relationships. But it's a story of repentance, confession, forgiveness, new life, and joy. It's a story of fleeing from God and meeting God. It's the story of turning what appeared to be a disaster into a blessing. It's a story of Jacob. Now it's particularly relevant for an end time people who will pass through what scripture calls Jacob's trouble. We're going to study that a little bit later. But let's go back and look at a biography of, Joseph, of Jacob's life. And in that life, we see five phases of Jacob's life. In every one of those phases, we see lessons. Lessons that jump out at us. Lessons that shout at us. Lessons of defeat and victory. Lessons of sorrow and joy. Lessons of hopelessness and hope. Let's go back to the birth of Jacob. Jacob and Isaac, Jacob and Esau were the children of Isaac and Rebekah. They were twin brothers. Esau was born shortly before Jacob. Now they're twins, but Esau is born just a little bit before. And as the result, Esau was the rightful inheritor of the birthright blessing. Yet at Jacob's birth, God gives his mother Rebekah a promise. Now you're going to re read that promise with me, Genesis 25, verse 23. Here there is the birthright promise. Now remember, which of these two children were born first? Which one was born first? Esau. So which one should have been the rightful inheritor of the birthright promise? Who should have been? Esau. But who was? Jacob. You got it. Genesis chapter 25. We're looking there at verse 23. So God gave a promise right at the birth of Esau and Jacob. And here's the promise. Genesis 25 verse 23. And the Lord said to her, to whom? Who's the her? To who? Rebekah, the mother of Jacob. Two nations are in your womb. Who are those two nations? Jacob and Esau. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So the older one, Esau, would serve Jacob. In other words, Jacob would receive the birthright. Now as the boys grew, Esau loved hunting. He loved adventure. He didn't like staying around the tent with his mother very often. So he was out in the fields hunting game, bringing the game back to his father. Esau was Isaac's favorite. Unfortunately, there was sibling rivalry in the home. The Jacob stayed around the home. He often would prepare meals with his mother. And, ja and Jacob had more of a spiritual leaning, more of a spiritual inclination. Rebecca especially wanted Jacob to have the birthright. So she often lobbied with her husband Isaac. And she lobbied him to give the birthright blessing to Jacob. Isaac wasn't buying it. He knew that Esau was born first. And by the way, Esau was a man's man. He was out there hunting. He was adventuresome. He was like his father. The birthright was going to go as far as Isaac was concerned to Esau. Now what did Rebekah know from the birth of Jacob? What did she know? She knew that God had promised Jacob the birthright. She knew that. What did Jacob know? He knew about the birthright. One day, Rebekah overheard a conversation with Isaac and her son Esau. And the conversation really troubled her. Genesis chapter 27. Rebecca makes a serious mistake at this juncture. She overhears a conversation. And she feels that she has to go into action. She has to step into action. Genesis 27. 
we're looking there at the fifth verse. What did she, under, what did she overhear? Ladies, be careful what you overhear your husband saying to your children. God can have a way to solve that problem without your influence, lady. All right, Genesis chapter 27. We're looking here at verse 5. Rebecca was listening. What was she doing? She was listening. Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau's son. And Esau went out to the field to hunt game to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make me savory food that I may eat it and bless you with the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to my command. You go out to the flock. Bring me two choice kids of goats and I'll make food. And then you go into your father so he can bless you. What was Rebekah doing here? taking God's work into her own hands. Rather than trusting God, she overheard a conversation between Isaac and Esau. Esau goes out to hunt the game. And what happens? Rebecca says, look, look, he's going to get the blessing. I better help God out here. I better help God out here. I better do something. Have you ever been impatient, mama? And you thought, you better help God out here. You better help God out here. That's what happened to Isaac and Rebekah. And uh, in their family. And that's what happened to Jacob. And that's what happened to Esau. So Esau goes out into the field to get the favorite game. Now, I should add this so we understand. When a Jewish father was going to give the birthright to his son it was ordinary that they would have a feast for the entire family and that feast then, at that feast, the birthright would be given to the son. But here, Isaac was going to have a private meal with Esau and bestow the birthright blessing on him at that point. Now, rather than waiting for God's timing, rather than allowing God to solve the problem in his own way, Rather than trusting God by faith, Jacob and his mother resorted to deceit, lying, and misrepresentation. Urged on by his mother, Rebecca, Jacob deceived his father and lied about his identity. He desired the birthright that was soon to be given to his older brother Esau. Now, what was the root of Jacob's problem? If you really boil this down, what was the root of Jacob's problem? The root of Jacob's problem was really lie in two areas. One was lack of faith that God could accomplish what God promised. That was one problem. But the other pro root of the problem was self-pity. Self-pity. Esau does not deserve this birthright. I do. Rebecca's problem, self-pity. My husband is moving faster to give the birthright to Esau. This is not right. And both Jacob and his mother believed that they were being treated unfairly. They believed that they were be tr being treated unjustly. They believed that things should not be like that. And as the result of that, they took their lives out of the hands of God and acted in ways that later brought them great disaster. Now, was Jacob more qualified than Esau to have the birthright? Absolutely. See, the inheritor of the birthright had three specific responsibilities. Number one, the firstborn who received the birthright had preeminence over the entire family. So they were like the, the, the father of the family. Secondly, the firstborn who received the birthright was the spiritual leader of the family. So they became the spiritual leader of the family. Uh, Jacob was much more spiritual in his inclinations than Esau was. Thirdly, the firstborn who received the birthright was the inheritor of most of the father's wealth. That's what Esau wanted. Esau wasn't concerned about leading the family. He wasn't concerned about the responsibilities that he would have to lead the family and be a counsel, guide. He wasn't concerned about spiritual leadership. Esau wanted the wealth of his father because Isaac had a lot of flocks. The problem with Rebekah and with Jacob 
was that rather than trusting God, they pitied themselves. They said, look, this is not fair. This is, this, this is not just. This is not right. Now, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 180, this insightful statement. Jacob and Rebekah succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright, and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. When the situation in your life appears hopeless, do not take yourself out of God's hands and do something rashly. When the situation in your life appears hopeless, trust God that he is going to fulfill his promises for you. Now I continue. God had declared that Jacob should receive the birthright and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. But like many, like, like, like who? What's that, what's that word? But like who? Many. And many is many. Like many who now profess to be children of God. Do we profess to be children of God? Sure. They were unwilling to leave the matter in his hands. There are some times that the best thing you can do is nothing. You missed it. <laughs> Did you get it? This, there are some times that the best thing you can do is nothing. And leave your life in God's hands and watch what God is going to do. L living a life of dependence, living a life of trust, living a life of faith. But many, I'm continuing to read Patriots and Prophets 180. But like many who profess to be children of God, they were unwilling to leave the matter in his hands. Rebecca bitterly repented of the wrong counsel she had given to her son. It was the means of separating him from her, and she never saw his face again. When Jacob fled from his home, he left for 20 years, and his mother never saw him again. She made a rash decision, and because of that decision, she suffered for the rest of her life. But what about Jacob? From the hour when he received the birthright, Jacob was weighed down with self-condemnation. He had sinned against his father, his brother, and his own soul and against God. And in one short hour, he made work of lifelong repentance. There are times when the situation appears hopeless in your finances, you make some crazy decision. There are times when the situation appears hopeless in your health and you make some foolish decision. There are times when the situation appears hopeless in your marriage or with your kids and you make some foolish decision. You look back on that and you say, God, why did I ever do that? Why did I ever do that? And you live in lifelong sorrow. Lessons echo and re-echo down the century from an Old Testament story that speaks to an end time people in this generation. Now Jacob believed that the birthright should be his, not his brother's. He felt left out and unjustly treated. His attitude was summed up in these words, poor me, my brother's receiving the birthright and it's mine. I shouldn't be treated unjustly. I found an amazing quote by Stephen Fry. He makes this insightful statement about self-pity. And this is what he says. Self-pity will destroy relationships. It'll destroy anything that's good. It'll fulfill all the prophecies it makes and leave only itself. And it's so simple to imagine that one is hard done by, that things are unfair, that one is unappreciated, that if only one had a chance at this, only one had a chance at that, things would get better. You'd be happier if only this, that one is unlucky. All those things, and some of them may be true, but to pity oneself as the result of them is to do oneself an enormous disservice. Self-pity led Jacob to lying and deceit. Lying and deceit led to a fractured relationship with his brother Esau. It led to separation from his father and his mother. It led him on a 20-year journey from home. Now, when Esau returned from his hunting expedition and learned that Jacob had gotten the blessing, Esau was so incredibly angry that Esau made a decision to kill Jacob. His, he was furious 
His one desire was to kill his brother. So now, Rebekah overhears his plans again and urges Jacob to flee. Sin has its consequences. Filled with guilt, Jacob flees as a fugitive. He would never see his mother again. The relationship they once had was over, forever. Driven by a condemning conscience, he began the long, arduous journey from Beersheba to Haran, the home of his mother's brother Laban. See, Rebekah's brother was Laban. And therefore, she felt that Jacob would at least have some protection and some comfort there. So she said, you must go. He left, headed, head, headed for Haran. It was a 500-mile journey. Beersheba is in the south of Israel, and uh, Haran is on the border of Turkey. Jacob's heart is heavy. He wanders alone 500 miles. Now, can you imagine it? He's wandering 500 miles. After two days of traveling through the barren desert, it probably took him a month to get there, he's ever on the lookout for bandits. He's on the lookout for hostile tribes. He's exhausted. His heart's heavy. He's consumed with guilt. He's weary. He lied to his father, deceived his brother. He's separated from his family. He's distant from everything that is familiar. Now, you can imagine this. He's walking through the desert. It's hot. He's sweating. The sand blows. He's dirty. His head is down. His head is swirling. He travels for two days alone. He has to travel for a month, weary, alone, exhausted, guilt-ridden, too tired to take another step. Jacob lays down on the cold ground with a rock as a pill when he goes to sleep. But God breaks through his dream and gives the fleeting fugitive reassurance of his presence. Take your Bible, Genesis 28. Now notice something absolutely critical in this story. At this point, Jacob was not seeking God. God was seeking Jacob. At this point, Jacob is not seeking God. God is seeking Jacob. God looks down on Jacob's hopelessness. God looks down on Jacob's despair. God looks down on Jacob's guilt. And we look here at Genesis 28, verse 11 and 12. Genesis 28, verse 11 and 12. So he came to a certain place. This is Jacob. He's tired. He's weary. He's exhausted. He's guilt-ridden. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones that place of that place and he put it in his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there were angels of God ascending and descending, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give you in your descendants. Now let your eyes drop down to verse 15. Behold, I am with you. God makes four promises to Jacob. Jacob is filled with despair. Jacob is filled with guilt. Jacob is hopeless. Jacob is alone. And God makes four promises to him. It is not that Jacob is coming to God. It's that God is coming to Jacob. The ladder reaches where you are. Wherever you are on life's journey today, Christ comes to you. He descends down the ladder of heaven. Jesus meets you where you are in your hopelessness. He meets you where you are in your grief. And God made four promises to Jacob and he makes four promises to you. Here's his promises. Verse 15. Behold, I am with you. Jacob, I'm with you in your guilt. Jacob, I'm with you in your sorrow. Jacob, I'm with you in your disappointment. Jacob, I'm with you in your hopelessness. Promise number one. You see, what a reassuring promise to Jacob. What a reassuring promise to Jacob. Jacob is wandering alone. He's away from his father, away from his mother. He's away from his descendants. He's tired and exhausted. And God says, Jacob, you may be alone and you may feel hopeless, but I am with you. Promise number one. Promise number two. I will keep you wherever you go. In other words, I'm going to preserve you, Jacob. 
I'm going to preserve you. Your life is not for nothing. Your life is not in vain. Jacob, hold on. Promise number one, I'm with you. Promise number two, I'm going to keep you. Promise number three, I will bring you back to this land. Jacob, years may pass. Jacob, decades may pass. But Jacob, I'm going to bring you back to this land because I have a purpose for your life. Now notice the last one. Until I have done what I have spoken unto you. In other words, Jacob, I'm with you. Jacob, I'm going to preserve you. Jacob, I'm going to bring you back to this land. Jacob, I have a destiny for you, and I'm not going to let your life collapse in hopelessness. God is speaking to somebody here today. God is touching somebody's heart today. God is saying to you, I have a destiny for you. God is saying to you, I have a plan for you. God is saying to you, I have the ladder descended right where you are. Now, what came up and down that ladder? What came up and down that ladder, everybody? What came up and down? Angels. Jesus is the ladder. He meets us where we are. The latter, of course, represents Jesus, the one who links fallen humanity with the eternal delights of heaven's perfect world. Jesus reaches you where you are, whatever your circumstances. Angels go up and down that ladder because of Christ and minister to our hearts. Broken relationships, fractured friendships, hurting marriages, the ladder reaches where you are. Failures, mistakes, guilt, condemnation, a sordid past that haunts you. The latter reaches where you are. Weakness, spiritual frailty, complacency, lukewarmness. The latter reaches where you are. Can you say with me, the latter reaches where I am. Say it together. The latter reaches where I am. Again, the latter reaches where I am. God says to you, where are you today? I'll reach you where you are Jacob's dream. Jacob continues to flee. Despite Jacob's failures, despite his lying and deceit, despite his selfishness and greed, despite his lack of faith and misplaced trust, God still had a plan for Jacob's life. The latter reached where he was. Now, he named that place Bethel. It was the place Jacob met God. It was the place that he began again. See, when he left home, Exhausted, tired, weary, filled with guilt and shame. He was downhearted and discouraged and hopeless. But he comes to Bethel. He has the dream. God speaks to him in that dream. And Jacob has new hope again. The next morning, Jacob heads for Haran with a new spring in his step. A new resolution in his heart. He had met God at Bethel and that made all the difference. The journey didn't seem as long anymore. When we travel life's road with Jesus... The most challenging journey is easier. Now arriving at Haran, Jacob meets Rachel. And although it's love at first sight, he, he has that stirring in his heart. He senses this is the one for me. He makes a decision that she's going to be his wife. But the interesting thing is, he has to labor for her. Love is patient. And Jacob's love was patient. Seven years laboring for Rachel. Now you may have courted your wife for seven years and she may have said no six times. But the seventh time, all right, <laughs> you've been so persistent. Now it's very fascinating though. Jacob deceived his father and his future father-in-law deceived him. Labor seven years for Rachel. He gets Leah. Then he has to labor seven more years for, for Leah. I want you to think about the law of sowing and reaping in the Bible. The law of sowing and reaping in the Bible. When you look at scripture, very often Bible characters reap exactly what they sow. For example... You got three Hebrew worthies that are thrown into the fiery furnace, but the people who throw them in are consumed and burned up. Daniel's cast into the lion's den, but those who cast him in are eventually eaten by the lions. Haman makes gallows to hang Mordecai on, and he's hung on those gallows. Asa places a prophet in prison, 
And then he, he puts chains on the prophet's feet, and Asa gets a foot disease. David commits adultery with Bathsheba and has her husband Uriah killed, and the child of David dies. Jacob deceives his father and has a conflict with his brother. His father-in-law deceives him, and he has terrible conflict with his own children. Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. What lesson for an end-time people are we learning from an Old Testament biography? The decisions we make have repercussions far beyond those decisions. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. Although Jacob was forgiven, the consequences of his actions were not immediately changed. So our actions have consequences. Galatians 6, verse 7. Notice. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man or woman sows, what's going to happen? They are going to reap. We reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow, and we reap after we sow in the future. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, sow a thought and you reap an action. So an act and you reap a habit. So a habit and you reap a character. So a character and you reap a destiny. Now the question is this though. Our actions have consequences. The sins of our past, although forgiven and we are changed, often haunt us today. That's what the Bible means when it says visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the third and fourth generation. It does not mean that the fourth generation has the guilt of the fathers in the first generation. What it does mean is that there are genetic predispositions, that there are habitual shaping of character that passes down from generation to generation. So here is the question that we need to raise, and it's a critical question. Can you ever break the generational cycle? If in past generations there is the law of sowing and reaping, and if you look back in those past generations and you see that law of sowing and reaping and you see the consequences of that in your own family today, can you break that generation cycle? The traits of character developed in one generation are often passed to the next. But here is the incredible good news. We can break the generational cycle. Wherever we find ourselves in the cycle of life, we can begin a new legacy. Through the grace of God, we can have a new beginning. Our families don't have to repeat the cycle of the past because Jesus breaks the cycle of dysfunctionality. He heals our brokenness so we become channels of love and ambassadors of grace. If the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that we are not locked in generational cycles of the past. Actions have consequences. They're passed from one generation to the next. But there can be generations that say, by the grace and power of God, if there's any man or woman in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. All things are made new. Jacob was learning that lesson. And he was learning that lesson, and it took him 20 years to learn it. Seven years labors for Rachel gets Leah. Seven years labor is for Leah. My labor is now rather for Rachel. Seven more years. Fourteen years. Then he stays with Laban another six years. So 20 years goes past. And in those 20 years, he's learning faith. He's learning dependence. He's learning confidence in God. He's learning to break the generational cycle of the past. And God says, okay, okay. Jacob, it's time to go home. It's time to go home now and get your inheritance. It's time to go home to be with your family. It's time to go home, Jacob. I have a promise for you. I have a destiny for you. Jacob, 20 years ago, when you fled and I met you at Bethel, I promised that you would inherit the land. Jacob, you 
are ready now. After serving Laban faithfully for 20 years, Jacob sensed it was time to go home. Although he was fearful of what Esau might do, he knew that he had to return to the land of his childhood. Every mile of the long 500-mile journey back created greater anxiety. He feared his own safety, and he feared the safety of his family. He was going to meet Esau. Genesis 32, verse 7. He's coming back home now. How is Esau going to receive him? Genesis 32, 7. Whereas 20 years before, Jacob took things in his own hands, now, in spite of his fears, now, in spite of his anxiety, now, in spite of his worry, he is trusting God. God said, go home. He had a fairly comfortable life with Laban. He had flocks and goats. and God said, go home. Genesis chapter 32, verse 7, describes his journey home. So Jacob was greatly afraid. Now, it's interesting how the Bible puts it, isn't it? It doesn't say he's afraid. What does it say? He's greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and their flocks and their herds and the camels in two companies. Now, you can really understand Jacob's strategy. He says, okay, Esau is going to come. Esau is a warlike man. Now, Jacob's company has no weapons. He has no trained soldiers. He has just his family and they're with his flocks and herds, and they're coming. As they come, he says, okay, I'm going to divide us into two companies. Because if Esau attacks one, at least one of us can get away. Jacob, though, knows, after he divides them into two companies, that he needs to spend time alone with God. And so Jacob is facing the greatest test of his life. And we go to Genesis chapter 32 here. He's about ready to meet Esau. He gets the word that Esau's armies are coming. Genesis chapter 32, and you're looking there at verse 24. This passage is one of the most critical passages in how you can turn around a hopeless situation. It was written centuries ago, but it echoes and re-echoes down the corridors of time to us today. Genesis 32, verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. Esau's armies are coming. Esau's warriors are coming. Esau's mighty men of war are coming. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of of the day. What led Jacob to that experience of being alone? You read it in the 10th verse, Genesis 32, verse 10. Jacob repents, he perseveres, he prevails. Genesis 32, verse 10. Notice what Jacob says. I am not worthy of the least of all your mercies, and of all the truth which you have shown your servant for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I've become two companies. Jacob now recognizes that the primary fault is not with Esau, but it's with him. You will never have change in your family if you blame your children for the problems. You'll never have change in your family if you blame your wife for the problems. You'll never have change in your family if you blame your husband for the problems. Jacob came to the point in his life of hopelessness and despair where he had to take responsibility himself. And he took the responsibility on himself. And what does he say? I am not worthy of the least of your mercies. Jacob says, whatever Esau has done, that's with Esau. I can't deal with that. But I can only deal with Jacob. And my heart is weak it is desperate. I am not worthy of the least of your mercies, of all the truth which you've shown your servant. God, you've been so good to me, and I'm the one that failed you. On his knees, as he prays, he wrestles with God. Christ comes down. Now, it's interesting. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, 
And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint and he wrestled with him. You know, I don't know why I chose this sermon this week. But you know, this week I think I was lifting something and I pulled a muscle in my uh, thigh here. Couldn't walk for most of the week even today. Man, I'll tell you, it's so much pain. And I hadn't ended up in the emergency room because I had to find out what was going on here. But anyway... Jacob wrestles with God and God touches his hip and so he goes back to Esau you know he's limping like I am you know he's limping back to Esau I'm saying no oh, God touch my hip and, and you know do something good for it don't 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 you know bring it any more pain but you know it's really interesting and so you go back here Jacob perseveres with God so what does Jacob do he he repents of his sin he he acknowledges his guilt he prays to God he holds on and God promises, I am going to bless you, Jacob. Now, there are four lessons from Jacob's night of wrestling that I want you to see. For, but before we do that, we should look at the statement in Patriarchs and Prophets 197. Here it is. Patriarchs and Prophets 197. This is really insightful. Through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender. Now, this Jacob, through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender... This sinful, earring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. He had fastened his trembling grasp on the promises of God, and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. In other words, Jacob did not come with a litany of things that his family did wrong for him. Jacob came with his own repentance, his own humiliation. Now, four things Jacob does. What does he do? One, Jacob acknowledges his own faults. Two, Jacob seeks God in repentance. Three, Jacob preserves until he prevails. He doesn't have a three-minute prayer and give up. Four, Jacob receives strength to face his brother because he looks into the face of God. Now, what happens as the result of that? What happens as the result of that? Look, Genesis 33, verse 4. When Jacob acknowledges his own failures, what happens? Genesis 33, verse 4. He's been separated from his brother for, for, for 20 years. But something happens. Something happens. Genesis 33. We're looking here at verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him, to Jacob, and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and wept. Think of it. God brought the broken relationships back together again. Now, when Jacob was praying... What happened? One of the great advantages that Seventh-day Adventists have is the unique spiritual insight that comes through the writings of the gift of prophecy. So Jacob's wrestling with God all night. But what happens? Look at Ver Patriarchs and Prophets, page 198. While Jacob was wrestling with the angel, another heavenly messenger was sent to Esau. In a dream, Esau beheld his brother for 20 years in exile from the father's house. He witnessed his grief at finding his mother dead. He saw him encompassed by the hosts of God. This dream was related by Esau to his soldiers with the charge not to harm Jacob, for God, the God of his father, was with him. Jacob is praying. Don't miss this. Jacob is on his knees. He acknowledges his weakness and his sin. As he prays, his prayers ascend to heaven, God sends an angel to Esau. God sends an angel to Esau. And the angel comes to Esau, and the angel says, look, this is God's anointed. Don't touch him. And the angel shows Esau, Jacob, praying in his prayer. And the angel says to Esau, you now go to your soldiers and tell them, don't, don't, don't touch. God has a way of divinely solving problems that we cannot recognize. There are divine solutions to our problems at times of hopelessness when we trust and depend on God. Jacob had learned a vital lesson that he had not learned 20 years before, and that lesson was not to rely on his own strength, but to trust the promises of God. Now, I want you to picture this scene. Esau's warriors are approaching Jacob. Fear fills Jacob's heart. This is before he wrestles with God. He wrestles all night with the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. An enemy army approaches. 
He has no might against them. Everything around Jacob spells defeat. Every earthly support is cut off. The future looks bleak. Death appears certain. Now the prophet Jeremiah, who writes a thousand years from the time that Jacob writes, takes this experience and projects it to the end time, to the last generation of people that live on earth, and talks about Jacob's trouble. You find that in Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7. Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7. And we find it there. And here we find coined the expression for an end time people of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 5 to 7. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. So here's the voice of fear, not of peace. It's a time of trouble. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with a child. What kind of question is that? Is man ever in labor with a child. In other words, this is a time of labor pains. It's a time of deliverance, it's a, but it's a time of great anguish. That's what Jeremiah is getting at here, a time of anguish. Like a woman in labor, all faces turn pale. Alas, for that day is great, so that there's none like it. So there's a time coming, a time of trouble, when people will be uh, impacted. That day is great, there's none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners will no longer enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God. Before the coming of Jesus, there will be a union of church and state. Laws will be passed that restrict our religious liberty. There will be a time of trouble. When every individual has made their final irrevocable decision for or against Christ, probation will close. As probation closes, shortly thereafter, a time of trouble will come on this world when seven last plagues are poured out. That period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. God is leading us today to go through experiences that apparently are hopeless. Why? Because he wants to lead us to deeper trust. He wants to lead us to deeper confidence. He wants to lead us to deeper faith. So God is going to allow us to go through those experiences. Now, if we are going to face a time of Jacob's trouble in the future, if we're going to face a time when every earthly support is cut off in the future, if we're going to face a time when there is no possibility of humanly getting through, if that is the case for the future, when will God teach us those lessons? When do you think God is going to teach us greater lessons of trust? When do you think God is going to teach us greater lessons of faith? When do you think God is going to teach us greater lessons of confidence? When do you think that is going to happen? It's going to be happening now, isn't it? So if you go through something that is apparently hopeless, you go through some disappointing experience, you go through some financial problem, marriage problem, health problem, what is God doing? God is preparing us for a time that Jeremiah calls. What time does Jeremiah call that? Jacob's trouble. God is preparing us today to have greater dependence, greater trust on him. Now we see in one more time, we see Jacob's descendants. One more time. When we come to the book of Revelation. And there in the book of Revelation, in the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, we have the holy city. And above the gates of the holy city are the names of Jacob's children. Because when Jacob wrestled with God, Jacob's name meant deceiver. But when he wrestles with God, his name is changed from Jacob to what? Israel. And Israel means one who's wrestled with God and what? Prevailed. So Jacob prevails. 
his, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are above the gates. Simeon, Reuben, Naphtali, they're there. Dan, they're there above the gates. Now, in a Virginia court of law, they could be tried for treason. They could be tried for adultery and bigamy and, and robbery. They could be tried and put in prison for murder and for the rest of their life. But what do we find? Their names are above the gates. Why are their names there? Because God is a God who turns hopeless circumstances into circumstances filled with hope. Their names are there to say that if they could make it, you can make it too. If they can be there, you can be there too. If they can triumph, you can triumph too. Their names are there to reveal to us that we can go through the troubles in life today with our hands in the hands of God. We can go through hopeless times today with our hands in the hands of God. We can go through the times of difficulty today with our hands in the hands of God. We can learn lessons of trust, dependence, faithfulness, confidence in God that will prepare us to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. So one day, just as Jacob went home to his father, we will go home to our heavenly father and live with him forever and ever and ever and ever. I want to learn those lessons of trust. What about you? I want to learn those lessons of faith. What about you? I want to learn today that with Jesus, there is no hopeless circumstance. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, our hearts overflow with lessons from an Old Testament story, lessons that speak to us where we are. Father, help us never take our life into our own hands and make crazy decisions and spoil your destiny for us. Father, help us to know that the ladder reaches where we are. That wherever we are, there's the ladder. It's right there. The ladder that leads us from earth to heaven. The ladder that turns our darkest nights into glorious days. The ladder that turns our valleys into mountain peaks. Help us learn the lessons. Help us take not 20 years to learn them like Jacob. Help us be quick learners. And Father, help us also not to blame others, but to take responsibility for our own actions. And by your grace and through your power, transform, I pray, our lives. And Lord, may we see every trial today and every difficult today as, a, as an opportunity to learn deeper faith and trust. And one day, may we meet Jacob in heaven Help us walk through those gates and look up and see the names of his sons on those gates that give us hope in times of hopelessness. Lead us from this place today filled with hope. In Jesus' name, amen.